Hello and welcome to the June 10th, 2014 regular business meeting of the Cape Elizabeth School Board. If you would all please join me in rising and saying the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Item one, are there any adjustments to tonight's agenda? Well, I'm aware that our Onco principal for the day may be a bit late due to baseball playoffs. He will be coming at some point, and as of yet, I don't see our um, senator or representative in the audience, so we may need to adjust the order of recognition or the timing. I, I see he sent his substitute, though, principal. Okay. His <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so we may we may have some changes in the in the order of events here, but we won't we won't have any adjustments to the agenda. Um, item two: approval of school board minutes. May I have a motion? I move we approve the minutes as listed in our agenda packet number two, executive session Tuesday, May thirteenth, twenty fourteen, regular business Tuesday, May thirteenth, twenty fourteen, and workshop Tuesday, May twenty seventh, twenty fourteen. Second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, item three are of our student uh, representatives. Uh, Sierra is, I understand, <laughs> studying for finals probably, and, and um, Tim has Flown the graduated and, <laughs> and uh, is, is nowhere to be found. <laughs> Um, I want to thank them again, both of them, for the, the, their assistance throughout this year. They've been invaluable to the board. So, um, But we won't be hearing from them tonight. Uh, item four, are there comments from the public on agenda items tonight? Seeing none, we'll move on to item five, communications. Um, and. If Senator Platt is ready, so I walk in the door with a huge pile of, of um, legislative sentiments. You can Welcome. use our table if you need like to. You know what, I'm just going to pull a chair over. There you go. Good evening, everyone. As you can see, we have a bounty this evening. Do you want help, Rebecca? Good? I'm good, thank you. Um, and I was hoping to uh, catch you in, in, in advance of the meeting, but if you could read one legislative sentiment all the way through, um, and, if, and let us know if the other ones are substantially similar, because we have a, we have a long night ahead of us tonight. And um, also, I wanted to mention that if anyone who is being recognized wanted to address the audience or the television audience or the board, um, that they're welcome to do so, uh, just to let uh, indicate to either to Rebecca or myself, and we'll, we'll be happy to make that option available. Okay. That sounds like a good plan. Okay. I'll do my best to be expeditious. So, ladies so, and gentlemen, we have a plethora of legislative sentiments to recognize the talents and dedication and um, skills of our, our students. And again, I, I'm just struck by um, <clears throat> how wonderful our students are. But and that's also an indication of how wonderful our teachers, staff, school board, community, parents um, are and the support that we provide them. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so we have a wide ranging number of sentiments from individual to team, teamwork. Um, I will do my best to be brief, um, but at the same time I also really think that these, these individuals um, deserve this moment of special recognition. So we're going to start off with Jane Vaughn. 
Is she here? She is. Wonderful. Why don't you come on, Jane? So, welcome. So be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing Jane Vaughn of Cape Elizabeth, a senior, congratulations, at Cape Elizabeth High School who was chosen by poet Richard Blanco as the first place winner of the seventh annual uh -oh, Maraconeg Poetry Festival. Jane's poem was entitled The Tall Figures of Giacometti and Mr. Blanco, who was the inaugural poet at President Obama's second inauguration, chose it from a series of 20 finalists. We extend our congratulations to Jane on her receiving this honor and we send her our best wishes. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And I'm going to just read this next section once um, for the evening because um, it is rather extensive, but it's important that you know who has been involved in this process. Given this 22nd day of May 2014 at the State Capitol Augusta, signed by Justin L. Alfond, President of the Senate, Mark W. E., Speaker of the House, Derek M. Grant, Secretary of the Senate, Millicent M. McFarland, Clerk of the House, sponsored by Senator Millett of Cumberland County, Representative Monaghan Derek of Cape Elizabeth, and Representative Hammond of South Portland. Well done, Jane. And next we have David Dutton. And David's not here, but Principal Shedd will accept on his behalf and will make a little announcement at, after you've finished. Okay, fantastic. Oh, I'm sorry he couldn't be here. So be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing David Dutton of Cape Elizabeth. David, a junior at Cape Elizabeth High School, was part of a two-student team that won first place in the 2014 Ford AAA Student Auto Skills Competition for Maine. This competition tests students' knowledge of and skills in automotive technology. David received a scholarship of $10,000 and an opportunity to attend the national competition in Dearborn, Michigan. We extend our congratulations to David on his winning the Ford AAA Student Auto Skills Competition for Maine and send him our best wishes on his participation in the national event and on his future endeavors. And be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. So congratulations, David. Wow. On behalf of David's family, I just talked to his grandmother today, actually, and she gave me this update. Um, that David is in Detroit tonight and is flying home tomorrow because he just took third place in the national competition wow. for the same level of competition. So that's awesome, awesome result. Wonderful, thank you. And I just let me scoop back up. Okay, so. Sorry. Sorry, I have a cold, I apologize. <laughs> Um, so we have three teams, Model, U, Model UN teams, that um, participated in events this year. So perhaps what I'll do is recognize all of them together, of those who are here. So if the um, Dartmouth Model UN, John Hopkins Model UN, and Brown Model UN participants would like to come and join me if they are here. There are some here, and there, there are coaches here as well, Ms. Oliver. Oh, great. So Welcome, Ms. Be... Miss, Miss Oliver. Please come up. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so. Wouldn't you love to see them at the real UN? I know I would. So, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the following Cape Elizabeth High School students who participated in the Dartmouth Model United Nations Conference. Oh my 
goodness, Sarah Packlett, Daniel Menz, Tom Gleason and Alex Mukai, who received verbal communications, Luke Gilman and Jana Friedman, who were cited for having their but the best position papers, Andrew Holliday, who was given an honorable mention, Addie Wood, Matthew, Riel Hatem, and Nick Shedd, who received outstanding delegate awards, and Jack Call, who was named best delegate. We congratulate the students on their participation and accomplishments in the conference, and we send them our best wishes for on, the, on their future endeavors. Um, I'm just going to keep reading, then we can clap all at once. <laughs> and then, so be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing the following cable is with high school students who participate in the John Hopkins University Model United Nations Conference. Henry Gent, Danny Brett, Alex Mukai, and Luke Gilman, and their advisor, Melissa Oliver. The conference is a four-day event every February for some 2,000 high school students from across the country, sponsored by the John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. Henry Gent and, or Gent and Danny Brett received honorable mentions for their work, and Alex Mukai and Luke Gilman received outstanding delicate awards. We extend our congratulations and best wishes to the students on their achievements. And then um, we had a slight bit of an error in this one. I apologize. It should mention the whole team, but it says, in recognizing Matthew Riel Hedem and Alex Mukai, students at Cape Elizabeth High School who received outstanding delegate awards at the Brown University Model United Nations Conference, we congratulate Matthew and Alex on their participation and accomplishments at the conference, and we send them our best wishes on their future endeavors. Congratulations, everyone, for your extraordinary performance. There's some team members who wanted to speak. <laughs> Hi, my name's Jack Hall. Um, I guess I'll speak because I'm a senior, so unfortunately, this is my fourth and final year um, of Model UN. Um, I just want to thank um, th these teammates who are here um, and the teammates who weren't able to come. Um, they were a huge part of all of our success and. Um, it's just a really great community. Uh, for those who don't know, Model UN has run through the World Affairs Council at Cape High. Um, so both of those clubs were hugely important for me um, in learning about international affairs, being exposed to things like that. Um, and it's actually had an impact on my career choice. I'm going to be majoring at, um, in international business at uh, University of Georgia next year. Um, so thank you to all you guys. And thank you especially to Ms. Oliver, um, our coach. Uh, it's been great four years, and thank you a lot. I can't thank you enough. So congratulations, everyone, and thank you again. Before you start, Senator Millett, I just wanted to mention also that Jack um, and some of his colleagues also helped organize a Model UN team at the middle level this year for the first time, which was um, a really exciting step forward for the district and something we hope will continue. That's wonderful. Well, there's, there is a theme this evening, which is, that, and, I, and I meant to say this, that I would extend a special thank you to those staff members who make a special effort to find the A student's particular passion and interest or to guide them towards something that they will find rewarding. And I know that their days are not easy just covering the materials that they're supposed to be covering in the classroom and the fact that they take the time in their evenings and on their weekends and their vacations to help provide such a, uh, a broad and deep um, exposure to the world and to themselves um, is truly a gift. And I think um, I speak for many of us who are very grateful for that. So thank you. And you will see as we continue through this evening how this just transpires. <laughs> because. Next, we have the Cape Elizabeth High School science team. A couple of student representatives here as well. Fantastic. So come on up. <laughs> so be it known to all that we members of the Senate and the House of Representatives join in recognizing the Cape Elizabeth High School science team which has won the North Shore Science League competition for the third time since the school began participating in the competition. 
Cape Elizabeth High School is the only Maine high school that has fielded a team to participate in the North Shore Science League competition. The competition is organized and run by a collaborative of high schools in Massachusetts. The North Shore Science League competition is not a single event competition. The member schools hold monthly meets throughout the school year, providing many different opportunities for students to solve creative science problems and challenging students to apply their knowledge of biological, chemical, physical, and earth sciences. We extend our congratulations to the members of the team on win their winning the North Shore Science League competition and send them our best wishes and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forth with on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. So this next one is um, a story I think that's worth just taking a, just a couple of seconds to talk about it because it's about the woodworking students at the Cape Elizabeth High School and what they provided for the Camp Susan Curtis in, in Stoneham. And I don't know if there's anyone here from that class. There's not. That's, too, that's unfortunate because I don't know if they're aware of the... Um, the children that, and, and youngsters that they are helping. Um, they, I <clears throat> was fortunate enough to get some information about Camp Susan Curtis over the legislative session. Um, and basically what they are about is to build individual character, self-confidence, and self-esteem of economically disadvantaged Maine children through the provision of tuition-free, high-quality camping, educational, and social experiences. And I think it's wonderful that um, in a town that tends to be very fortunate, um, it can take some of its time and its resources to, to help um, such a camp provide these um, experiences for these kids. And um, just as a couple examples, um, last year um, there was a camper who had been at four schools in the prior six months and was living in a hotel because her family was homeless, jobless, and carless. Um, there was a, a young gentleman whose father died in a car accident years ago that left his mother with a traumatic brain injury. And there was a young girl who had been in 12 foster and group homes because of chronic history of abuse and parental drug addiction. And the list goes on and on. So um, it is uh, wonderful that um, our school and our staff members saw an opportunity for our students to not only develop their woodworking skills but also to um, provide this resource to the camp and so be it known to all that we the members of the Senate and House of Representatives join in recognizing the woodworking students of Cape Elizabeth High School and their teacher Jim Ray who are the recipients of the Camp Susan Curtis Spirit Award. The students built 60 bunk beds for children at Camp Susan Curtis in Stoneham. The new wooden beds replaced the metal beds the camp opened with in the 1970s when then Governor Ken Curtis and his wife Polly founded Camp Susan Curtis in memory of their daughter Susan. The students are working on the second installment of beds which should be ready for campers this summer. We extend our congratulations and best wishes to the students and Mr. Ray on their receiving this award and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 126th le legislature and the people of the state of Maine. So wherever you are, workers, good workers, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> this <laughs> is equally impressive. When I started, when I, I did not know the full extent of um, and the depth of what we are about to discuss when I first came forward with the sentiment and quickly learned that there wasn't one team, but yet, um, let me smoke, four. Cape Elizabeth High School teams that won the Maine Principals Association Sportsmanship Award. Hmm. And um, 
as many of you who know me personally, I found that inc very delightful and very um, special about Cape Elizabeth. And um, I just felt like I, I was really struggling to capture why it really um, struck me so much. So I went online and found a couple of quotes, and I'll share them with you. First one is from Wolf, Ralph Waldo Emerson, and he said, what lies behind us, what lies before us, are small matters to compared to what lies within us. And then I'll finish off with Newt Rockney, who said, one man practicing good sportsmanship is far better than 50 others preaching it. But here we are, I guarantee you we had more than 50 practicing it. So isn't that a wonderful thing for Cape Elizabeth? So we have the Cape Elizabeth High School volleyball team. Oops, sorry, my apologies. The Cape Elizabeth High School football team. The Cape Elizabeth High School girls ice hockey team. And the Cape Elizabeth High School boys basketball team all received the Maine Principal Association's Western Maine Class B Good Sportsmanship Award. All the Class B teams in the region vote to determine which team receives the award. So we extend our congratulations and best wishes to the team on its receiving the award and be it ordered that these official expressions of sentiments be sent forth on behalf of the 126th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Jeff, are you here to? Yes, our athletic director, Jeff Thorak, is here to accept on behalf of Thanks. the teams and their coaches. Fantastic, Jeff. Do you want to say something? Yeah. yeah. Great. I'll just leave these here then because they're really heavy. Just uh, take this opportunity to thank our state legislature, our state senate, and our legislature for um, their sentiments. And uh, it's truly an honor for me to be um, standing up here and receiving these, um, this recognition. I think it's easy for us to see all the good things our kids are doing in the newspaper or at award ceremonies. Um, but this honor is truly a reflection of what our student athletes are doing on the fields, in the pools, on the courts, um, whatever it may be, on the ice. And it's also a reflection of our community because part of this, the coaches vote on this, um, the MPA Sportsmanship Award. And part of it is what's happening in the stands, what's happening on the sidelines, what's happening in the field. So really this is um, a, a reflection of, of Cape Elizabeth and the good things, the support and the positive things that uh, our kids and our families are doing. So um, we also, they send us a banner. So this is sort of what they look like. I should point out, we have two members here from the basketball team, Jack Hall and Luke Gilman. If you guys just want to stand up real quick again. No. <laughs> yeah. How's your goal? We had not hung this yet because we're doing some work in the gym and we didn't want to have to put it up and take down. But um, we have 11 of these right now currently so this is uh, quite an honor and just learned that our girls tennis team also received it again so um, <laughs> we're thrilled to hear that so thank you again it's really uh, nice to be yeah. representing our students and appreciate the honor thank you And as I clean up, I would just like to note that I am aware that there are several extraordinary teachers who are retiring this year, to my, as my heart breaks to saying it. Um, it has not gone unnoticed. I, unfortunately, I was unable to get them here for this evening, but um, when teachers such as yourself extend the kind of service that you have to our children and our our community in our schools, um, they should be not just noted, but celebrated and exalted. And um, so they're on their way. Um, so just for myself personally, thank you so much for your service. And thank you for your patience. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Millett.
um, and thank you uh, once again, as I said last time, for recognizing such a such a the, the wide variety of, of of talents and capabilities that uh, Cape Elizabeth students have have developed in their time here. So I appreciate um, I appreciate seeing this this diversity of of skills and and capacity in our students. Um, so thank you. Um, and so on to item 5C, the STEM fair. I believe Mr. Shedd is. Uh, yes, I think Principal Shedd was going to speak briefly about the STEM fair held at the high school in late May. So um, last spring, um, Roger Rio, who's a math teacher at the high school, came and really the whole STEM fair was his brainchild. Um, and his idea was that STEM is an area where there are growing numbers of job opportunities, which is not the case in some other areas. And wouldn't it be neat to bring in employers and talk directly to students? I think it was somewhat inspired by the experience that we had in the December before that with the TEDx uh, event and sort of trying to think along those lines. So, so Mr. Rio sort of gathered together a core group of teachers who've worked very hard for almost a year um, organizing the STEM fair, uh, which was held on May 22nd, I believe it was. Um, in the high school, there were three keynote speakers, um, including a professor from UMO, uh, a gentleman who created his own company and created an app about the national parks, uh, which was well received. And the third one I'm forgetting, I don't know, uh, it, yeah, I'll come back. It'll come to me as soon as, as soon as I sit down, it'll come to me. And then students, the 9th, 10th, and 11th grade students, because by this time the seniors were gone on their senior transition project, which is why we were all able to fit into the auditorium, um, and, and that date was sort of deliberately selected, um, got the opportunity during a part of the morning to visit with, I think it was almost 23 to 30, I don't remember exactly off the, but many, the gymnasium was filled with presenters from all across, some with Cape Elizabeth connections, some with Cape Elizabeth High School connections, some with just connections in the region. Um, there are a tremendously wide variety of people who presented from actuaries um, to car mechanics, uh, to the UMO engineering program brought several students down, to orthopedics offices and eye doctors, and there was just a whole the Department of Public Health. Um, so there was just a tremendously wide variety of folks who um, who presented, and I know that I've heard from at least two students since that time that two students ended up getting business cards, and I think they've actually ended up with summer jobs or internships directly because of the STEM fair um, program. So it was tremendously successful, and I would be remiss in not mentioning, in addition to me, Mr. Rio, whose brainchild, who, who really came up with the idea initially, and I can't say enough about you know, how much work he put in and, and others put in, but Ginger Raspiller from the Achievement Center was highly instrumental from the, she's an organizational genius, um, and she brought with it the experience of having worked at the TEDx event, and then Chris Newell, who's also in the math, uh, math, math department, and then um, Evan Thayer from the science department helped a considerable amount, a considerable amount as well. Um, there were many students who volunteered um, to help out with the STEM fair, including some of those folks who are here as well. Um, and I think almost all of our students would agree it was a, it was a morning very well spent. So, you know, and I should say also thank you to the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation and its donors uh, for um, contributing a significant grant uh, to make that event possible. In fact, last night, uh, the folks who put on the STEM fair presented to CIF um, to report on the work that they had done. So they decided they should present there and send the principal here and talk on their behalf. So basically that's where we are with, with the STEM fairs. But thank you f to the school board for supporting it. Um, um, I know the board has been asking questions and very interested in STEM and where its place in the high school curriculum and those sorts of things. So The other speaker was from the Maine Manufacturing Association. She was thank their you. education outreach person. Right. Thank you. Jeff, I'm wondering, <clears throat> it was such a huge success and it's probably too soon afterwards to ask this question, but are there any plans for a repeat? Well, the thinking is probably every other year. Mm 
um, just as the thinking with the TEDx event is perhaps every other year. Um, so next year, I, th I think, is if things go the way we hope they will, a second TEDx event, mm -hmm. and probably the year after that um, for the STEM event. Dynamic. Thank you. And, and can, I just, can I just say to the students that um, I, I whispered to Jane that it's traditional for them not to necessarily have to stay during the rest of the... <laughs> and I know, John, you probably would have gotten to it, but I wanted only, to give them... Only those who just graduated are required to stay. <laughs> <laughs> the rest of you should go The rest home. goes Thank study. you. about the STEM fair as well, that one of the, one of the most fun things for me to observe being there was that students were sort of prompted that they had to make sure to speak with, look people in the eye, and ask at least a couple of questions of a few people at the event. And it was great to see the level of interaction between students and employers, and um, including our ninth graders who hadn't had perhaps some experience in talking to people in, in that kind of an environment. So I think it was a great introduction for them to that. Wasn't there an award you get your card stamped by? Was there something? I don't know that there was an award. I think it or was. You get into yeah. drawing? There was, there was a, for juniors, juniors were asked to oh. do a business card, and then they had to fill something up. There was a wrap on the end of the day. That's what it was. My junior came home with something, and she was like, look, I won. <laughs> she was excited. Thank you, Jeff. Um, so moving on to um, 5D. Uh, we are going to honor our retirees, and I believe Principal Hassan is here to, sp to speak to our, fir to our first two retirees, Linda Paul and Suzanne Janelle. Good evening. I've had the pleasure, actually, of working with all three of our distinguished retirees, so I'm going to say a few remarks about Linda Paul and Suzanne Janelle and leave Principal Shedd to speak about his um, beloved retiree. Um, Madame Janelle, felicitation, mon ami. I'll end it there in French. Uh, Suzanne Janelle has brought such passion and true joy and the love of having our children learn languages at both Pond Cove and at the middle school. And I've had the pleasure to see her work her magic at Pond Cove for our third and fourth graders in this past year to see her work this magic with our second graders. And if some of you, um, for, for folks watching who have second graders, um, it, they love this. And you can even ask our superintendent, who's, there's a certain song that she hears at home all the time. I could sing it for you, but her daughter does a much better job than me. Um, so it's really been such a joy. And um, I think what's pretty distinctive of Suzanne Janelle is she has been teaching for, she's been teaching world language now second grade through middle school, which is really extraordinary when you think about how seamless it has been for her, that she has been able to do it on such a range of levels, because not just the level of the language learning itself, but the developmental aspects of, of the children that she's been teaching. So it's really been extraordinary. Um, Suzanne, you will be missed, and all of us at Pond Cove and the middle school wish you well. And I could say something in French, but you know, I, I sort of did that at the staff meeting, and I won't put you through that again. So, um, but we really, really will miss you and wish you, wish you well. And Linda Paul, um, to so many of us, is the quintessential kindergarten teacher. And she really embraces the joys of early childhood every single day. And she began as an ed tech at Pond Cove, and we are, we've been so blessed that she became a kindergarten teacher and stayed here in Cape. And to, to return and work with her again has been a, a gift to me. But um, there has not been one day when she has not showed utter joy and what her job is. And even today, as you know, the principal for the day is um, hopefully striking out a lot of opponents against <laughs> Right now, he will be coming. But all day, he kept wanting to go down to her room. And every time we went down, 
he's a fourth grader. Every time we went down, she was, she was out with her class somewhere, and so it was throughout the day, and we went around to all the classrooms, and he, he said, well, do you think, when do you think Mrs. Paul's going to be back? And this is a fourth grader. This is the impact that she had on him. Mm. Um, so, Linda, your dedication to your students um, is unparalleled, and we shall miss you. We have no doubt you will have your perpetual tan and um, maintain your fabulous laugh. You brought such a positive spirit to Pond Cove and um, to our whole culture. And we know um, without question that um, you will still embrace your love of our youngest learners. So it's been a pleasure and congratulations to both of you. And the, the board has a, a small token of our appreciation for each of you, if you could come forward. So while, while John's handing those out, I will say Suzanne started with the FLESS program, which is the foreign language in the elementary school program here 25 years ago. We're celebrating our 25th anniversary this coming year. And as the parent of one of those second graders, I can say um, it's been a real, a real pleasure and a real treat to watch the program grow and expand under your dedication and those of your colleagues in world language. But thank you for your service and devotion to world language. And um, the lessons you have taught will live on in this district. So thank you. And as a parent of one of Linda's current kindergartners, <laughs> I, I can say that she has given our earliest learners a, a wonderful foundation and um, helped them experience the real joy that learning should be and come home every day with smiles on their faces. So thank you for that. And now we will have a... Oh no, I'm sorry. Now we will have the principal shed, and then we will have a short recess. You just want to cook it. <laughs> uh, thank you, <coughs> Jeff. So, um, Andrea Clear came to Cape Elizabeth High School um, a while ago. <coughs> I heard a hundred years I've, ago. I've heard very different accurate? versions about how long she's been there, but she you would, but she's been there for a while and shaping the positive um, sort of culture in her classrooms within the health and PE departments and really within the entire school. Um, I've considered a great, wonderful, good fortune to get to know Andrea and to work closely with her. I respect her as much as I've respected any teacher that I've ever worked with in my career. Her dedication is absolutely, knows no bounds. Um, her dedication to her students. She has incredible amount of energy. For the last several years, she and I have been um, uh, uh, co-members of a community partnership called HOPE, um, which is designed to sort of spread information and open a conversation in the Cape community around, around substance issues. And one of the things that is true at almost every HOPE meeting is Andrea, who comes from a lot farther away than I do, is always on time, and I am virtually always late, which is quite impressive. Um, I will also say that she created, I believe she created, um, the Natural Helpers Program in the high school, uh, which is a day one collaborative where students are selected by their peers um, to sort of act as listening boards and friends and mentors for other students in school. It is a highly successful program. Um, and one of the things that is true about Andrea is I think she believes, as one of her core beliefs, that a school is going to do something, it ought to do something very well. Um, and the Natural Helpers Program, every detail of how the kids are selected, um, I'm not going to bore this, the school board with all the details of it, but it really is quite extraordinary how hard she works to get things to, to work really well. Um, I'm not going to repeat some of the other things that I, I've said about Andrea in other venues. Um, uh, but I will say this, that the other day I had Joyce Nato, who's a social worker, come to me. Um, and I, don't, I actually don't remember what the context was, but she was coming to talk to me about a student um, who was in a deep crisis. And she's a student who um, you would never guess that she was in a deep crisis from the way that she carries herself. And she told the story that um, the way the student had an in to talk with Joyce was because she had developed such a good relationship with Andrea over the years um, that 
her first conversation, her first stop was with Mrs. Kayer, who then brought her, after a while, building on her relationship, to come to Joyce and to get some assistance and some attention. And Joyce, who has worked in several schools, says it is absolutely unique in her experience for the health teacher to build, to, to be such a regular avenue, a regular channel of support for students well after the teaching experience of the student with the health teacher has gone. So um, congratulations, Andrea, on your well-deserved retirement. Enjoy your grandchildren and your children, which is what is drawing her away from us. Um, and just you've been a, a joy to work with. Hi, Suzanne. And Linda, would you like to come up too? <laughs> I have only a couple of repa uh, prepared remarks. Um, gosh, I don't, I don't even know how to, to talk anymore. Uh, thank you, school board, for your support of all teachers and programs. Um, and all the school boards before you, I've just always admired your dedication and your willingness to work so hard to create a really wonderful experience for your kids, for our kids. I really want to thank the administration, um, all of the wonderful principals I've ever worked with, and uh, specifically Jeff. Uh, he alluded to our work in school, but also in um, the HOPE Substance Abuse Action Team. I have never worked with anybody who works more earnestly and harder and talk about detail. I mean, he's the master of detail, um, both in our school and in the HOPE Substance Abuse Action Team, and it's been a real treat for me to work more closely with you, Jeff, um, on the Substance Abuse Action Team. And just, you know, thank you for all of your, um, your work on behalf of that particular program. I really think that we've got wonderful colleagues, parents, students. Um, I've always been so proud, no matter where I've been, at any venue, at any time in my career, from the first day as a teacher and coach to the last days. Um, I've never been prouder than to be able to say, um, I teach, I coach, I advise at Cape Elizabeth. It's always been something I've been so proud of. And I've always tried to instill that in any of the students that I work with, is to represent Cape Elizabeth High School well and proudly. I also I want to say that no one does this work alone, that I've been surrounded by so many caring, excellent staff members and people everywhere, from maintenance to food service to all of the updated terminology I should be using right now. I just can't think of it all. But honestly, we are such a team. And I've loved being in the belly of the high school building because I, I love that I know everyone by their first name, all the people who really make a school a school and make it happen. Um, and I think that's one of the benefits that I've had. And lastly, um, I've said this in other places, but I think what makes my career so unusual is that I have taught in this building, teaching physical education, out in the field out here before it was a parking lot, in the basement where the technology is, teaching physical education with the balls banging off the ceiling and everything, with our little fifth graders and sixth graders. In the middle school, I've taught in the middle school in the basement of the, of the 30s building. I started here before the high school was even ready. And I just feel so connected to the community. I don't know how I'm going to leave, but I just thank everyone so much. I've loved my experience. Thank you, everyone here. Thank you here, and God bless us. It's a beautiful community, and I've loved working here. All good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll ask you back. <laughs> Thank you, Andrea, for epitomizing the values that we as a school system have set forward in terms of community and passion and ethics and, and academic belief. Thank you. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm.
all the different students that I've brought and how beautiful each and every single one has been and all the different little things that they bring to the table. And so I thought, what better than beach stones to um, be symbolic of that. So that was great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. And now I know board members would want to express their gratitude in person, so we will have a short recess so that we can, we can do so.
<laughs> it was to totally <laughs> surprising to me. Yeah. I meant to turn that off. I'm going to look it up just in case. <laughs> Who's going to rash with that? Hmm? He and his buddy took three. Oh. Yep. Okay, welcome back. Three sodas are great. The Tuesday, June 10th, Cape Elizabeth School Board regular business meeting. Um, I want to once again thank our, our retirees, and uh, we, will now, <laughs> we will now move on to item 5E, the annual report of volunteer services, and I believe the superintendent and also Elizabeth Seifries have remarks on the volunteer services. Sure, and I just want to recognize um, that Gail Schmader, our volunteer coordinator, is here as well, and she may join in at any time. So I, I would welcome her to do that. Um, the Cape Elizabeth School Department has received the benefit of over a thousand volunteers this year. That includes parents, grandparents, students, community members, um, providing support to all of our students. The total of 22,000 hours of service to the school district this year by, by Gail's count. Um, and she's equated that to a, numer a numerical monetary value of about $330,000 if you figure sort of a daily, daily rate or um, the equivalent of 17 full-time positions, meaning full people putting in um, full days with our kids for uh, the full academic year, 17 people. So it's pretty incredible when you think of, of all of the community members who come forward and um, when I think of the fact that that's organized by one person, that's pretty impressive as well. Um, in addition, our community contributes tangible resources, and this year, again, from donations, um, the value we put on that is about $10,000 worth of resources donated to the schools. We have um, a career fair that we hold each year with our eighth grade students, and again, people from um, all sorts of professions come in and talk with our middle schoolers about their work and their career choices and following their passions. And we have 36 students who served as mentors across K-8 this year. So working with other students and providing social emotional support and academic support and really just being um, a, an older, wiser um, friend to um, look up to and receive some support from. So thank you to Gail for coordinating all of, all of these efforts, but thank you especially to our volunteers for all the, all the effort they put into our schools and, and helping us be a strong community. Thank you, Meredith. Meredith pretty much stole my thunder. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I, I just want to reiterate that I that the volunteers are a major strength and resource for our Cape Elizabeth schools, and it it, it was astounding to me, to me to see that Gail oversees at least 1,000 volunteers. But I kind of wanted to touch on the, the just a quick range of the the different sorts of things that volunteers do. Um, some of us, including myself, are fourth grade spelling book correctors. It's a wonderful job. Um, but there's photocopying, there are people that work in the media center, there are people that help with artwork, with writing, with reading, with chaperoning. Um, the functional life skills swim program would not be able to happen without volunteers. Um, the, the different uh, big events like Arts Day, Career Exploration, STEM Fair, all these things that uh, Meredith did touch on. Um, it's amazing what a gift of enrichment these volunteers give to our students. And so I wanted to thank all those volunteers who give their time and talent to our students. And a very special thank you to Gail, our Director of Volunteer Services, for her amazing work. Thank you. Welcome Thank back. you for your very kind words. It is a true pleasure to do it. And I, as I spoke to a few of you during the break, it, I, love, I love what I do. I feel like I'm cut out for this job. It's my dream job. And many of us do get to do our dream jobs. Um, I also talked to a few of you during the break about um, the mentor program. And Andrea Kayer had some wonderful feedback. Um, she often is requested by students to write a recommendation. She nails it every time. Thank you, Andrea. It, her comments are so helpful, and she sends me some of the most wonderful, wonderful students from all levels, all um, types of students in the high school. And thank you to Jeff for 
sending them down to us. But um, they are miracle workers this year. There were um, 36 or 38 of them. I think that that is probably one of the most satisfying parts of my job is to work one-on-one -on -one with these students and to see the progress that they make with their mentees. Um, in my report, I state that mentor relationships are low-key interventions for students. The caring, committed high school mentors make positive differences in the lives of kids. And these kids are doing, these high school kids are giving meaningful service. And how sweet is that? Um, there's a quote that is um, from a, a book or paper, I think it is, called Because You Believed in Me. I'd like to end with that. Um, it takes only one, one person, one unexpected possibility, one ordinary moment of insight to create a life-changing experience. These mentors are doing it. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. Thank you, Gail. So we move on to item 5F, resignations. We received two resignations um, for the upcoming school year, one from middle school special educator Rob Thompson and the other from Janet Dewan, who's a part-time art educator at the high school, and we wish them both well in their um, future pursuits. And then on to item G, the superintendent's report. Okay. There's a lot to cover. It's the time of year when there's so much going on, we can hardly keep track. Since we last met, um, I was able to join Senator Millette and Representative Derrig um, at the Chamber of Commerce meeting with the legisla legislators. Um, Town Council Chairwoman Jessica Sullivan and Councillor Molly McCausland were also there, but it was just a great opportunity to speak informally about the issues that are um, of concern to us locally, and they were um, very responsive and informative. So thank you to them and to the Chamber for their support of that meeting. We received our state report cards um, since we last met. Um, both um, Cape Elizabeth High School and Cape Elizabeth Middle School received A's from the state. And again, that, those are based on metrics that are published on the state website. At the high school, that includes partially graduation rate along with proficiency on standards. Um, at the middle school and at Pond Cove, and Pond Cove received a B this year, but at, at both of those schools, those metrics look at proficiency on state assessments, so our NECAP assessments, um, as well as progress and growth of students. So it looks at growth. Um, and I would say for Pond Cove, the issue, and it's one that we've identified as part of our strategic plan, is really the growth of some of our lowest quartile students. So our students who are struggling the most in school didn't make the level of growth that we would hope for them to make. And again, that's something we've already identified as part of our strategic plan work. So um, we look forward to to seeing those improvement for those students moving forward. Uh, the Cape Elizabeth High School held induction for the National Honor Society members, and I'm not going to remember exactly how many students. I want to feel like it was close to 20 students were inducted this year. So congratulations to those students and their families. The high school held the prom, undergraduate awards, the sophomores did their research presentations, our high school student reps aren't here, so I'm going to try to hit all their highlights. Um, we already spoke earlier about the high school STEM fair, which is a great opportunity for our students to interact with um, some community partners and business partners. The middle school band marched in our Memorial Day parade, so thank you to um, Caitlin Ramsey for leading them out there. And um, We don't have a marching band, but they did all right. They hold their own. Uh, we were awarded our SEEK grants, and I'm going to make sure I hit the list here. So thank you to the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation for the um, fall, spring cycle. The spring cycle, um, and the money actually will be available for the fall. Um, they presented $9,000 to the TEDx Youth Program at Cape Elizabeth High School, so there will be a, TED a TEDx event next school year. Um, $8,500 for advisory program training at Cape Elizabeth High School. $3,500, somewhere in that ballpark, I can't see this very well right now, um, for a math lab lending library at Pond Cove. Um, $7,500 to the Cape Elizabeth Then and Now 250th Anniversary Project at Pond Cove, and um, that project is designed to bring um, elementary school, school students together um, with seniors in the community, but to begin to learn a bit about Cape Elizabeth history and create an art project that will be available um, and displayed in the community and $2,400 for um, two faculty members to attend the Institute for Writing and Thinking at Bard College, um, some summer workshops. So thank you um, to Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation for um, the grants of $30,950. 
Upcoming events, um, tomorrow night is the 8th grade celebration, as well as kindergarten information night, which is at 6 o'clock tomorrow in the Pond Cove Media Center. The 4th grade celebration is on Thursday at 1.30 in the Pond Cove Middle School cafeteria. Field days are ongoing. Um, some are already done, and the rest, weather permitting, will be held at Hannaford Field or the high school gym. We are in the midst of planning for summer programming and professional development. I have a list for that, too. We have technology professional development training going on um, for two days in June and again in August. We are doing some planning, obviously, for our summer school program. Um, we've got some staff development days built in for that. And again, I think we right now have in the, in the range of 80 to 90 students who will be participating in summer <coughs> programming with us this year. Um, in July, we have some science outdoor curriculum planning work going on and um, with some support from Cape Elizabeth Land Trust as well as the National Audubon Society. We have some middle school math alignment and planning work going on as, um, related to the math changes that we've spoken about previously. We have administrators and teachers attending the University of Virginia Differentiation um, Training Week. And um, the University of Virginia is also a, part, a national partner with the University of Connecticut for research on gifted education. We have project-based learning in partnership with South Portland, a three-day training um, that a number of our teachers are participating in. And then we'll start with our new teacher workshops back in August. So exciting professional development work coming up. And that doesn't include a lot of team meetings and individual team level planning and grade level planning. and. Um, some school-specific initiatives, including writing at Pond Cove and um, writing at the middle school in grade five and <laughs> proficiency-based diploma work and guiding principals work, so it's a pretty lengthy list. We are um, beginning iPad collection in grades seven through 11. We already collected them from seniors at the end of this week and going into next week, depending on um, which grade level students are in. We um, looked at the possibility of sending those home for a variety of reasons, including some logistical pieces for this year around insurance and, and um, in part weighing some community feedback. We've made the decision not to send them home at this time, um, but that is something we will be talking about um, moving forward. We do think they are an educational tool that, that has real value, and we'd like to work with our families about um, how to use them for education and help our students use them more educationally and less for some of those recreational pursuits that um, can come up with adolescence. The Cape Challenge was held on June 1st, so thank you to our parents' associations for a great event. It's really um, a delight to see so many young people out there running and um, exercising just good wellness habits, and many um, older members of our community as well. The last day for school um, for kindergartners will be Monday the 16th, and for all students, Tuesday the 17th. We are monitoring charter school enrollment. Um, at this point, we have nine students enrolled, which is a roughly eighty dollars to $90,000 impact to our budget. Um, of these students, four are not currently attending our schools. They're either homeschooled or attending private schools. So um, as a reminder, whether or not they're currently attending our school, if they're residents of the community, that choice to attend a charter school does impact our budget. Pond Cove staff um, has been working on technology integration. They shared some of the ways that they're using technology during their May staff development meeting. So teacher blogs, green screen technology for making student videos, graphing web pages, iPad um, apps and usage. They also did some cross-grade level work on the teacher college um, writing workshop pieces during the June 3rd staff meeting and um, we're talking about some of the strengths of the program and some ways to improve that work with students moving forward. I also want to point out that they had the main marimba ensemble here um, performing for students in grades K through 4, uh, music from Zimbabwe, um, and that was to, thanks to a grant from the Pond Cove Parents Association. So great partnership and support. And finally, the budget vote. I think is over now, uh, but hopefully we'll get the results of that this evening, um, and that will impact all of our planning for next year. Well, thank you. <laughs> Are there any questions? Meredith, I, I just want to say I know that um, a lot of these topics, it's easy to run down a list, but every one of them comes with their own hours of details since tonight is um, 
level of detail work that you have to do with administrators and teachers and parents. Um, and the iPad piece is a huge example. Um, thank you for um, having all the conversations you've had with parents about concerns about technology at home and still um, thinking about how ki what ki children need um, with technology. And it's it's not just a Cape Elizabeth issue. It is a yeah. It's a society. Issue. It's a society issue. Yeah. yeah. So thank you for that work you uh, you're doing. Thank you again to our, our, as you point out, Kate, there are so many things going on in this district that don't happen without the wonderful support of our, our faculty and our administrators and our parents and, and again, just the, the real work every day of our students. So it, it's fun to be able to celebrate all of those pieces. Okay, thank, thank you again, Meredith. Um, moving on to item six, new business, letter A. Uh, consideration to adopt the strategic plan goals and objectives measurements. Um, uh, I'd like to make a motion that we. Can, did I cut you off? No, go right ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we consider the adoption of the Cape School strategic plan goals and objectives and measurements as set forth in our savings packet. Is there a second? Second. Um, okay. Um. So I'll just start by saying we held a workshop um, in, we first shared these with you in February, a version of measurements, um, objectives and measurements in February. We then spent a workshop really talking about those because we didn't have a lot of time um, through the budget season to come back to these issues. So we spent a workshop um, on them at the end of May and we were then asked to take another look. Um, so in that very limited window during which there was a lot else going on for our administrative team, we spent, we spent some time trying to make some revisions to those that reflected the feedback we'd heard from you and that we felt um, aligned well with, with the goals that we've set forward in the strategic plan. That said, um, I, if it's not finished, we want to hear that from you. It's not you know, our expectation to sort of rush this process through. We appreciate that this is significant work and this is... Um, this is the piece that you as a board are using to determine whether or not we're making appropriate progress toward the goals that we've set forth in the strategic plan. So the time spent on the discussion of these items and the feedback that you provide is really important. And if we don't have it right, then we should keep working on it. So, and, and I just want to say as we, as we get started on this, that we're talking about the, the document that was distributed to board members today. Um, this, that looks like this. This is, this is the only document that we're talking about tonight. There's a, there's a larger document that was distributed at our, at our May 27th workshop that looks like this. <laughs> that, is not, that is not what we are right. discussing or approving. Correct. That document is the detail of the strategic plan and some of the action steps that we've identified as a district moving forward, but it is not the detail of, of how we're going to measure the effectiveness of, of our work. <laughs> So what, what's before us tonight are, are, you know, in effect, are the are the the objectives have already been approved. So what's before us tonight are the measurements, um, uh, the measurements which we would use to define success uh, around each objective. I have to say, I'd love some more time to look at it if we have the time because it was such a great conversation. Um, that workshop we had um, was really a fabulous conversation and, and I didn't get to read, I only read through it once today. Uh, understood and, and you know I, I apologize for the limited I, timeline. I think the turnaround given what's going on this time of year has been difficult. That you even got it to us was huge. <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to echo that sentiment as well. I mean, this is an incredibly important document on which our future success is measured. And so without meaningful review of where we are now and where we're going, I, I would hate to um, not honor the process that's brought us to this point. David? Um, I, I did review it, and it's not a lack of time, but I, I agree with the sentiment. Um, I think in the amount of time, given the 
toughness of this task was the administrators did a good job, but I think our administrators can do better. And I think we can, we give them more time, we can, we can have a better product. And I, I think we should take the time. Okay. Any other, any other comments? Uh, I, I agree we need more time at the same time. I don't want us to uh, think that um, let the perfect get in the way of the good. So I encourage us to have a time frame. So um, you know we could be doing this two years from now, and the clock has already started. So uh, I, I would like more time, but I would like us to have a hard deadline. So I have a proposal. Thank you, John. <laughs> <laughs> but I but I was wanted to let it, give everyone a chance to speak before I. Uh, I, I too, am, I'm impressed that in two weeks, given what I know is going on and all the, the vast that I don't know that's going on in the lives of our administrators, that we did get this back. Um, I, I still, I feel like we are looking for more alignment with our mission and vision, and, and I, I do have some feedback because. I did happen to walk into Merritt's office the moment these came off the presses. But um, I feel like it was such a time crunch and knowing what, what people have to do at the end of the school year and what's going on, I'd love for the administrators to have that ability to have some, you know, kind of deep and quiet reflection when things aren't pounding at your door at the end of the school year. And at the same time for board members to be able to look at this and uh, maybe give some comments and then you know in the next week or so to help inform that that contemplative work and then i'm going to stop talking and let john talk <laughs> well thank you so I, I mean i agree with the sentiment that's been expressed that um that we could use the board board could use a little more time to to get familiar with what we've what we've been presented with i did spend some significant time on this um uh, today um uh, and uh, I, I think administrators did tremendous work here. I see um, some significant improvement in terms of, I think it's more concise. We've, um, we've um, narrowed the number of metrics that we're looking at, which I think makes it easier to, um, to really understand what the district's focus is. Um, and I think we've added some, uh, some very important metrics um, to to this um, plan, um, particularly in terms of um, uh, multiple pathways for students um, for for um, becoming college and career ready. We've added a metric uh, that says all high school students will be able to meet proficiency standards through traditional coursework, independent studies, online courses, internships, and or field experiences. I think this is really beginning to get at um, you know, what I was hoping to see, which comes not from me, but comes right out of our mission and vision, um, where we say we value rich and varied learning experiences, we value work inside and outside the classroom, um, work that no nourishes joy and creativity and protects risk taking. I think a lot of that um, uh, is captured um, there, but I think there's, um, I saw less of that um, sort of multiple pathway uh, type of opportunity in the middle school and in the elementary school. Um, it's very, I think it's very well defined at the high school level. Um, again, I, I don't, I'm not here to, to come up with the ideas about how, how we want to do that, but I, I don't feel that at those levels that we're quite um, defining metrics which would, which would um, which we could use to, um, to measure success against uh, our, our mission and vision, which is really you know, you know, what I see as the goal. Um, the other um, key issue that I, I wanted to point out had to do with um, uh, the, the traits of integrity, empathy, uh, perseverance, etc. cetera. Um, there is a metric um, in here in which students would be evaluated on those traits under the citizenship category of the, di of the district-wide metric for the main guiding principles. There's a link to the main guiding principles. If you haven't seen them, it's on the state um, Department of Education. 
education website. They're quite good. Um, I guess I have a question about whether evaluating students on that those traits is alone is enough to get us um, to that goal. I, I, maybe I could be convinced that it is, but I'd, I'd like to have more time to, to think about that. Um, and I, and I still see, uh, key, you know, key, key parts of the um, mission and, and vision statement, which I think are, are um, um, unclear, unclearly or imperfectly de de defined in the metrics, including um, uh, rich and varied learning experiences inside and outside the classroom, uh, fostering meaningful participation in the local and global communities. Um, uh, although there is, um, in, along those lines, there is a metric um, in which every student will annually have at least one community-based experience or classroom partnership connected to school and district goals. I think that has the potential to be very strong um, I think it also has the potential to be quite weak um, in that I think we could, we could turn around and say, well, uh, we're already doing that. Every student has a, uh, has a community-based experience. They all walk to school every day or <laughs> traverse our community on their, way to, to, on their way to school. And I don't think that that's fostering meaningful participation in local and global communities. So um, the point of... My saying all this is to try to help, um, from, from my perspective, to provide some guidance. But I think in terms of uh, how we might proceed moving forward, what I would recommend is that we look to take these metrics up again, or a, a revised version of these metrics up again at our next business meeting, which is our August um, business meeting. Uh, and that, um, the, that the board, if, if people were willing to, would submit um, feedback in writing to me um, between now and the end of the school year um, that I could then share with uh, the superintendent and with administrators um, so that we had provided clear feedback on, on where we, as, or at least as clear as the feedback you're going to get from seven people um, of where we'd like to to take this. So if the board, if the, and then, so that's my proposal, Michael, for a time frame, is that the board would provide feedback by the end of the school year, um, and that uh, the board would take up the metrics again at the August business meeting. <coughs> so I suppose if people are comfortable with that, I don't know what the rules of order are around. Um, Should I revise my motion? The motion. I think you can just table it. So you can table the motion or you can withdraw it. So I would then move that we postpone the motion until our August uh, school board regular business meeting. Do we vote on that? Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in Se favor? Second. Yeah, you have to. Oh, so, uh, David, thank you. second. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you, David. Just to be clear, though, I don't want us to get here in August and we're doing this again. So we need. Any feedback board members need to submit to you by next Tuesday. <laughs> is that correct? Is that the, is that the, is that Yeah, you might want a little more time. Okay. <laughs> uh, June 30th? By the end of, but does, I want to make sure I give you and your team enough time yeah. though with that feedback, so. I, I think next Tuesday is doable. <laughs> We're, how about no. the end of next week? No, 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 no. I was just of, making sure I understood. How about the end of next week? Right. So a week from Friday. Friday the 13th? Friday the 13th. Yeah, a week from Friday. The 20th. You're talking yeah. Friday the 20th. That's right. Friday the 20th. Does that sound all right for you? Okay. If it's any longer than that, you'll forget about it. Um, and then we would have a similar motion at our August meeting. Okay. All those in favor? Okay, thank you. So now, on, what we're going to do now, because our, um, our uh, I understand a start
pitcher, and um, our Ponco principal of the day is here. So we're going to go off our agenda for a minute and go back to, um, to item 5A, the Ponco principal of the day. We have Anders Page Roth here. Uh, who has been the principal of Pond Cove today, and he's uh, prepared to tell us a little bit about his experience. Do you want to come up here, Mr. Page Roth? How the how the baseball right game go? Pull that microphone down. I think first we want to hear about how the game went. Uh, well, my day went really good. I met a lot of people, uh, had a lot of fun, pulled some pranks like with my little brother. We um, pulled a prank on the gym teacher. And um, he actually thought I actually did it and it was really funny. But overall, my day was really good. I really enjoyed it. Do you want to tell us about some of the rules that you developed for students today? Um, I developed some rules. One of them was like a free period, kind of. You would have maybe like extra recess, free choice. Doesn't really matter of your regular time of a recess. So, like, say your recess was 15 minutes, then you could have a 15 minute free choice or recess, and then you add on either 0, 5, or 10 minutes of recess onto that because it depends how good they were 0 as horrible and 10 as awesome. Uh, other ones I did was uh, uh, kids could wear hats, they could chew gum, bring in a f uh, favorite stuffed animal. Mm. And I asked for each kid to do one nice thing to somebody else in the school or maybe the teacher. It didn't really matter. They didn't have to, but it would be a nice thing if they could. Uh, there, you do not have to have homework. And that's basically it. How did that work out when you asked each, each student to do one nice thing? Did you, did you hear that that was happening, that kids were doing that? Uh, well, we kind of did it in the morning, so there's this inter the intercom. You would go up on the morning, say the morning announcements, and then you would say, uh, this is your principal, and then you would say your rules, and you would say maybe about who you are, or basically anything like what I said was, uh, uh, I kind of, kind of encouraged the kids to do one nice thing, and also talked about uh, Mrs. Nickerson and Mrs. Hassan taking like the day off, kind of. So that was fun. Um, and what uh, I did after that was I went from kindergarten to fourth grade talking with the kids and them, they asked me some questions about how I got to be principal or what my favorite rule is. And depends on that. A lot of kids said how I got principal. So I explained that a lot. Um, <coughs> I visited my little brother who kept on hugging me because he was so happy because he asked me if I, if I could do uh, stuffed animals, and I said, sure, and he was really happy because he had this st special stuffed animal he wanted to bring in. Um, that's about it, okay, basically. Well, uh, well th and thank you very much for being 
for being principal of the day today. We really appreciate it. How, would you like to take over for the rest of the year, or are you done being principal? Um, I would like being it for a little longer, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> like maybe for like a week or something. I mean, maybe great. I thought like maybe like one particular time we may, you could like choose something, and it could be like maybe principal for the week or like something <laughs> like that. Just or like on vacation. If I, yeah, um, well, in the day we had a few things to do. We had a few surprises. Um, we did a uh, fire drill, which was really nobody, only the te some teachers knew about it. And what we basically did was I went down and pulled down the fire. Uh, alarm lever and at first it was kind of weird because you think it's like broken because it's not making a sound and then suddenly it just burst out and you're like oh like whoa uh, but I got to uh, talk with the chief chief Gleason and I got to talk on the walkie-talkie and count if the kids were all there and then tell Mrs. Nickerson if everybody was there and then check if any everybody was at where she was patrolling and it all turned out really great. How did you get it for principal? Um well it's basically like there's a thing called bingo night. It's like bingo and there's a night and <laughs> a day before that, like two days a week, I don't know, before you uh, every single kid gets a little sheet with all these notes on it and you basically put your name on it and then your last name and then your address and then what you would like to try winning and then they put it all in the box so like all the principal principles that people want to try being are in one box and then all the people who want to try getting the cookie jar uh, the gift certificate are in another box. So basically, they would just pick out of each box to see who would win, and I was lucky enough winning. Did you win the cookie jar prize too, or is that you just didn't luck out with that one? Um, I mean, I didn't really, I don't really care if I won or not. I was kind of happy because it's going to be my last year mm -hmm. here in Bongo if I'm going to be in middle school next year. Mm -hmm. So. I was kind of happy about that, but uh, I just put in the least amount of money you could do, and that was for, I think, five or three dollars for 12 tickets, and I was fortunate enough to get there. Congratulations. It sounds like it's a nice way to wrap up your time at Pongo. Huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Anders. And, um, I hope you have a great summer and good luck in middle school next year. Was there... Oh, yeah, we interrupted some of the things in your report, so if there's oh, anything you missed. Um, well, one of my things was gum, and we actually, my friend Stuart Kelly, who's kind of like my advisor, he told me that actually CBS, when he went there, actually sold out of gum twice because <laughs> everybody was going there because it was like the closest place. So they had like no gum at all. And actually, my big brother, Cal Jackson, calculated how much money was made, was made and all, with all the gum. And the number was $1,716 were made from gum in that place. So did you get a commission on that? <laughs> um, New PCPA venture, sell gum on control for a day. <laughs> Good thinking. <laughs> well, great job. Thanks, thanks again. Uh, you, I really appreciate your being the principal for the day. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Andrew. And let me know when you're ready to Thank be superintendent you. for the day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that uh, between a, f a, f a free period for students, um, the encouragement of one nice thing per student every day, and um, the, the, the dis 
the um, D emphasis on homework and worksheets, you could uh, be an author of our strategic plan. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. So well, well done. Thank well you. done. Oh, congratulations. Oh, congratulations. It's a good way to end the day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Anders. Okay. Uh, that was fun. Now we have to go back to this <laughs> business. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I want to be a school board member. For this. <laughs> uh, item 6B, uh, may I have a motion, please? Um, I move we approve nominations for new personnel for 2014-2015 as follows. Catherine Atkinson for a kindergarten teacher. Amanda Aceto for a kindergarten teacher. Danielle Hessert, kindergarten teacher. Hare Norris for a 0.47 FTE physics teacher at the high school, and Noel Harif for the district's technology coordinator. Noel, but yes. <laughs> Is there any discussion? Uh, sorry, <laughs> I was recording the motion sorry, in a I second. Was looking for discussion from anybody. <laughs> I was making some so, notification notes. Um, the additional kindergarten positions are in order to fulfill our full day kindergarten um, offerings for next year and um, to replace Linda Paul, um, who's retiring. Our physics position, you may recall from budget discussions, is, a, is an additional need in order to keep our science loads um, within the guidelines. And um, I'm also pleased to say that we have wrapped up our technology search and, and are excited to nominate um, Noel for that position. So we feel we have a great, a great crop of new hires here and we look forward to having them start work in the district. And my apologies to Noel for That's okay. changing his gender. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Seven zero. Okay, item C, I have a motion. I move we grant the superintendent of schools the authority to hire over the summer. Second the motion. May I suggest an amendment to the motion? Please. Um, I would suggest adding with the exception of perhaps hiring the assistant principal at the high school. In the past, we've amended it around ad administrative level hires. Mm -hmm. I think just so. more generally, not yeah. that we're expecting any others, but just to be safe. Just to be safe. Okay. You've made the motion, right? Yep. Yeah. I accept the amendment. Okay. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion as amended. Item D. Uh, Joe. Um, <clears throat> I move that we um, put forth the following policies for a first read. These policies, as put forth in our agenda, are not uh, put out for vote, but for, again, for public um, comment. And those policies are ADC, use of tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems, JIC, system-wide code of conduct, JICH, JICHR, student alcohol, drug, and tobacco use and its accompanying procedures, and JKD, suspension of students. So I won't ask for a second because we're not actually voting. Um, uh, the purpose of the purpose of the first read is just that um, board members have the opportunity to see the the. This, these policies, as amended by the policy committee, um, over many, many, many um, uh, meetings, and and uh, lots of good thinking about this, and lots of input from community members and students, uh, and parents. 
um, and uh, the, um, the assistance of uh, our legal advisors. Um, and I would thank Ann Chapman for the work that she's done to help us with this. And um, so I think, so the, but the goal tonight is just to uh, engage in any um, full board public discussion that was valuable since the, the committee had wrestled with a, a number of uh, different parts of this, this policy. Um, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to also echo the sentiment of the thanks to all the hard work that has gone into this particular set of policies. Above all else, they tend to be the ones that um, elicit the most um, emotional reaction in the community, as well as probably some of the most oft pulled out policies and reviewed so that um, the importance of reviewing these for, for the committee has been um, just incredible. And I just want to put a, a thanks out to the building administrators, particularly our high school administrator, Jeff Shedd, who has constantly been asked the question, so what does this look like and what does that mean at the high school? And your invaluable guidance for us and the committee in working through those has been um, very valuable. Thank you. Um, and as well as the work of the superintendent NATO for putting hours together of gathering data and putting out surveys and organizing um, community forums on these issues so that we can get as much feedback and so that our policies can echo our community sentiment. Thank you for all that hard work that you and your office have put into that. And then also just the incredible hours of work that the policy committee has been reviewing these set of policies since last October. Um, at one point we felt that we would, were at a place where we could even put them out for a first read and then because of reactions of neighboring communities and their policies, we wisely pulled them back and took one more look and one more round of advisement from our attorneys. Um, to say that the um, emotional outpouring and the uh, enormous amount of intellectual pull and conversation and debate that we've had for these policies, um, I hope shows um, in the policies we put forth. Um, as you well know, any policies um, need uh, to be reflective of our community, but for these particular policies to be effective, in particular, they need um, community supports. They need to be based on the latest research. Um, they need to outline clear rules and consequences, consequences which are then communicated clearly and enforced fairly in order for these policies to be effective. Um, they also need to be a strong mechanism to usher young people at risk towards the help that they need. Um, and one of the other big challenges of putting these particular policies forward is that um, they need to meet our young people at a wide spectrum of needs. There are the students for whom um, there is the one-time mistake and, and that's all they need to be corrected and put on their way, all the way to the other end of the spectrum for those kids who experimenting with drugs and alcohol could potentially lead to a life of struggling um, into their adulthood. And as a matter of fact, um, for those who have worked in prevention or addictions, um, they will tell you that for an adult, um, to, a, to a person who has, as an adult, struggled with drugs and alcohol, they will all tell you it started in high school. And if only I had received help when I needed it most. It's for that broad spectrum that I feel that the policies that we have hammered out um, meet those needs from those who are just need a brief intervention and a referral back into, and then for those who need a little more help. And for that, I'm also incredibly grateful that our district has the support of our LADC, um, Joyce Nato, who can, and these policies do help usher students through and by her, um, can take that uh, expertise that she brings to our district and say, yeah, you're good, and, and send you on your way, or you know, 
have the attention that she can bring to those students who may need more help and, and guide them on their way as well. So to that, I also want to point out that we are incredibly fortunate to have those services here within our district. <clears throat> So with that said, I'm going to stop talking about them. Um, what we need from the community at this point is to please take a strong read, um, look through these, and see if they do mirror the expectations for which the community would find in these types of policies. And please um, refer, refer any of your comments back to either Superintendent Meredith Nado or myself so that we can incorporate those in future drafts if necessary. Is this an appropriate time just to ha have make a few comments? Yes. Uh, one, I know that uh, this policy, uh, I'm sure on the committee, it's viewed very, they're all distinct, um, but obviously they're integrated. One, I know there's some conversations about uh, the scope of the policy it has to do with co-curricular, and I know it's referenced in here, uh, policy JJJ, co-curricular and extracurricular activities. Mm -hmm. um, so is the strategy, it would be hard for me to vote on this without knowing how those changes or, um, you know, the community may view, well, what are you doing about if my child's, um, you know, at home during football season? Is that, in other words, that if, if there's changes to that policy, being considered might be helpful for the board or the members to be able to view that in context. You bring up an excellent point, and it was our hope and desire to be able to put those policies forth as a unit because they are so interrelated. Um, as you can appreciate from our description of the laboring over these policies, we wanted to ensure we could at least move as many forward as possible, and that um, JJJ is on our next agenda. And yeah, agenda. I would just. I would add to that, um, I think what we, what we tried to do in the development of both these policies is, is to really separate out JICH is a policy that applies to all students at any time on school grounds, at any time that they're participating in a school sponsored activity, um, and JJJ is an additional policy that has some additional expectations for students who are members of our athletic co-curricular and extracurricular um, activities. So. So this, these rules in JICH are for all kids all the time in school-related activities. And then the additional pieces that will be in JJJ apply only to those students participating in co-curricular and athletic activities, if that helps. It, it does, well, just because I reference it. So basically, if you vote on this as a board member, it's, it incorporates JJJ that may look different. In right. other words, you need to make a decision on this not knowing, but do you understand why that can be challenging. Completely understand the challenge there. And I also want to echo that we're not putting these out for at this moment for vote, that we're putting well, them out for, for feedback. And that when uh, my hope would be that when we do put them out for a vote, that they would be as a package so that we can see those interconnected. But thank you. You bring up a very good point. Just because that's one I get asked. You're in the focused on it, but I get asked about that as much. Absolutely. They're, it's blended together with this. Uh, it's all. You they know, are. If you're not on the school board, then there's distinct policies, but most, you know, it's, it's all the same issues. It's all the same. I have some other comments, but I'll email you those to be more efficient. Thank you. Dana? I didn't, oh, oh. I didn't know you were raising your hand. Go ahead. I hadn't raised my hand. John just looked at me and all of a sudden gleam in my eye. Go ahead. Elizabeth. You mentioned that you might be interested in commenting tonight. I, I do. Okay. I'm going to be brief. I also I want to um, thank the policy committee. Uh, I believe we started uh, back when I was still on the policy committee. We were working on these, and we're still working on these. Um, I I would like to say that I, I see a lot a lot of work put into this and, and it really shows I think there's a lot of progressive thinking in here. Um, I, I think one thing that has given different people pause, including myself and different community members, was around policy JIC and Article 8 referring to uh, assistance of law enforcement. And I, uh, that is a, a spot that we've always had law enforcement, but now we've got some 
different language in there that really talks about health, safety, and welfare of students and to uh, welfare of school students and staff, which I think is very reasonable and um, is a nice addition. So, um, and I see that kind of echoed in, in different parts of different policies. So I, it's really nice to see that. Um, I also am happy to see the the differentiation in um, JICHR, the differentiation around prohibited substances other than paraphernalia, tobacco products, and electronic nicotine delivery systems. I think that's a really common sense, thoughtful differentiation where there are uh, somewhat lesser consequences for first violations of um, people who have paraphernalia, tobacco, and electronic nic nicotine systems. I can only imagine that must have something to do with the fact that we do have some 18-year-olds who probably have, you know, legally obtained tobacco products and may forget or whatever and have those. So I, I think it's it's reason. I just feel I just want to say I feel like there's been you know a very reasonable approach. I appreciate that, and the differentiation of consequences around paraphernalia and tobacco products are not necessarily um, about being um, 18 or, or not, because those are types of consequences and, and um, banning those substances or things on campus also apply to our staff. Yeah. But it also has to do with the intent of the students right. um, and getting at the motivation and trying to address the motivations at different levels of um, uptake. So thank you for noticing this. Thank you for the clarification. No I'll just add that, that while we have focused on this policy around high school students, it applies equally to our middle school students. And a lot of people will tell you that issues with substance abuse began for them in middle school, not mm -hmm. just in high school. Yeah. So it's important for us to be mindful of the fact that we're looking at that full developmental range, not just our, our high school age students. I appreciate that. Actually, according to Mihas, the last I looked, um, the average age of onset for most kids can be between the ages of 11 and 13. Um, some of our most vulnerable. And as you may or may not know, the way that brain development works now and what we know about brain development is because adolescents are at a stage of such rapid growth, they are um, ripe for learning foreign languages in higher math and great writing skills, but because of the way their brain is forming, that doesn't make them immune to also learning addictions at that age as well. So hopefully we're protecting them from those influences. David? Um, yes, I, I have a variety of comments. Um, I did, for the public, I did distribute to the board um, a three-page list of some comments. I have been involved, though I'm not on the policy committee, but I want to give a little bit of history and some general comments about what I think are still issues that we need to work on. I first want to emphasize that w there has been huge progress made on these policies by this policy committee. I think we've moved from a draconian era of automatic punishment, automatic referral to law enforcement, um, in Reagan era uh, uh, approaches to problems rather than teaching, rehabilitating um, um, good common sense practices. And I think that's to the credit of the policy committee that we have moved far beyond that. Secondly, and I, I give examples, but one of them is we had mandatory reporting to law enforcement for a whole variety of things which simply didn't make any sense. So I, I think that's some pretty significant movement. Um, I do have a couple of, of issues that, that I want to highlight. Um, I still have some concerns about the reports to law enforcement uh, standard in JICHR um, it may be, to back up, the basic modern thinking is that, um, in my view, based on the evidence, is that you don't want to criminalize normal teenage bad, stupid behavior. You want to correct it, think about it, um, teach them things. We are a school system, we're not a, a penal system. And um, Dealing with bad be student bad behavior in school, except for truly serious problems, which should be reported, uh, I think should be dealt with in the school system, not the criminal system, using modern evidence-based methods such as progressive punishment, uh, restorative justice that comports with best practices in the field of education. Basically, as I think Joe mentioned, that 
current um, uh, neurology and thinking is that kids will engage in bad, stupid behavior. And it will occur hardwired by the fact that they have poorly developed prefrontal cortex lobes. It's going to happen. It's going to happen more than once. And that teaching good behavior is not best accomplished by punitive punishment. It's more by accepting responsibility, understanding consequences of their actions, which is what they're not able to do, and then atonement and teaching them. I think the school is the best place to do that, not the criminal process. And I think these policies make great strides in that regard. Uh, our main job at the school board is to educate kids, prim primarily academically, but also social, emotional, and so forth. I think we're not educating on either one of these points if we would punt this to law enforcement. We're better off bringing it within the school system to do what we do best, which is to educate kids to be good citizens using modern techniques, restorative justice, etc. Yet, we have to provide a safe environment for kids. And that's a tough balance. Um, I think Article 8, as written of JIC, strikes the right balance that we basically keep the kids within the system, we uh, involve them with our experts, our social workers, the substance use counselors, and we punish them within our system when we need to through suspension, expulsion, but we refer them out only in, in cases where, refer them to law enforcement, only in the case where there's a substantial threat to the safety, health, or welfare of the schools. Pretty broad, but also probably appropriate. Um, there are a couple of specific problems I have, which I outlined in my notes to people. One of them is, has to do with the language in um, AICHR, which has to do with terminology in it, but I, and I suggest alternatives, which basically is to, when somebody makes a mistake, that we try to keep them within the system, punish them within the system, but have a carve out, and, and then refer them out of the system if one or, two con one or two circumstances exist, that it's in the best interest of the kid to refer them to law enforcement, or it's necessary for their safety or health, where, where health safety, health care, sorry, safety, health, or welfare of the school system. Um, I think there's some language problems in that section that I think can be cleaned up. Um, on JIC, there is a sentence that still exists that says that behavior that violates the law may be referred to law enforcement authorities. Again, these are discretionary referrals as opposed to mandatory. I think that's too broad, and I state my reasons for it. It's just way too many things. I think actually in JICH we did it right. I think that the policy committee did it right in Section 8, which says that basically, again, it limits reporting to authorities to when there's a substantial threat to the safety, health, or welfare of the kids. I think that's appropriate. Um, my other major point, and I have some minor points that I think are probably the drafting errors or, or, or something, is on our list of prohibited substances. We have a phrase in there that the list of prohibited substances shall include but not be limited to, and we have a laundry list. I think that's wrong. I think that normal common sense tells you that if you're going to prohibit behavior, you need to tell people what behavior you're going to prohibit. And I think having shall but not be limited to means you can punish somebody for something that's not on the list. There's no way they can know it. They could have followed the rules, and they could still be punished. And regrettably, in this case, it's automatic punishment. Um, I think a very clever uh, solution came, well, it was, it's embodied now in a new draft, which has a catch-all, which says anything added a, a clause that says anything that might intoxicate you will be on a list of prohibited substances. That's pretty broad, but it, it's very clever, and I'll give credit to Joe Morrissey for coming up with that one. It, it does catch everything we'd want to catch. Uh, it's broad enough to include things we haven't thought of yet, but it, it tells kids if you if you're taking nutmeg or, I don't know, 10 oranges, if you're getting intoxicated, you're going to get punished. I think that's fit, broad but fair. And um, so I would strike that language um, uh, that shall, and make it shall be, because I think that broad catch-all does it. I think those are my major points. I have some minor points, since I was ordered to be crisp. But um, the key, I think, is I think best practices the most uh, highest level of medical knowledge, psychological knowledge is kids will make mistakes. Who do we want to take care of those kids? Who do we want to teach them? It's the place where it teaches. It's the place where we have social work. It's the place where we have substance abuse counselors. It's not law enforcement. I have nothing against law enforcement. Half my family's in law enforcement. 
but they're not equipped to teach kids. Consequences, those are social workers, and so forth. And I think that's the appropriate focus. I think we've come a long way towards getting that focus, and I just suggest a couple of changes to make it uh, tighter. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is there any other comment? I guess I want to say, um, being in the process when for, I think I'm three years now in the policy committee, and it is, I, I, if public is watching, I'm looking at the on air. All two um, people. Yeah, if anyone is watching, this is our handbook. This is our time to um, not be afraid of these policies, not be afraid if our children get in situations with these policies. We are school first, um, and the school has, since Meredith has been here, since I've been on the board, we have more, um, we have a, a license, help me out with the, the phrase. Substance abuse counselor. We have a substance abuse counselor. We have more um, counseling out, we have more, a teacher, has, we've expanded our team of people who can help children. We have Andrea Kerr and all of her knowledge, and the HOPE Committee was started, I think we're seven years, Jeff, maybe six? With HOPE, yeah. With, yeah, and that more and more people come to these meetings, not because it's fear-based, but because they want to learn about how to help the middle school students go up into high school. And the policies we're talking, and then the other thing that is, we're a little bit stuck on the word law enforcement. And we have amazing law enforcement people in town who are advocates for our kids before they get into these uh, tricky situations. There's a connection that people are making through um, walkthroughs around town. There's Hope had come up with an idea to have coffee with a police officer. So you're, we're bringing together some of these um, stereotypical forces that we're as parents afraid of with our adolescents who go out in the world and can use, who can get their hands on drugs and alcohol and substances and will do the range between experimental to getting in trouble. So these policies bring us to today and all these conversations, are, I think it's great that we're having them. I think it's great that Jeff and Meredith spent hours not only talking to us as a committee, but um, talked through with David to make sure that all of our points are being um, considered in here, and we want the public's point of view so that when we get to the next level, which is the what do you do with a high school student who's the the you know whatever uh, the tennis player, the whatever. Um, and we get into the situation. We 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 know we've come, you know we've come through it, and we're working together as a community. Um, so I'm so so even though it's been hours and hours of time that we've talked about this, it's all valuable, and I think we need the public's point of view to put their their um, voice into it. I just also wanted to point out one last thing, and I know it's getting late, but. Um, in policy JKD, suspension of students, um, in recognition that our youth, all youth, are susceptible to making mistakes and that in recognition of the um, desire for the community not to brand or place a kid on the wrong path because they've made a mistake, but allow them the space and time to own up to it, face the consequences and learn from it. We have an experimental provision in JKD where um, students can apply to our building administrator to have a, their first and only suspension um, struck from their record so that, you know, if it's a, a one-time mistake, you can, um, and that you've shown that you've learned from it, then um, we've given that provision in and out so that children or youth can um, have a clean slate when they leave here. And I, I find that um, an invaluable um, work that this committee has come up with that idea because um, for many, um, using these policies, the barrier that I think many of us emotionally face is I don't want to punish someone to the point where they'll never be able to outlive having made that mistake, but at least give them an opportunity to 
um, you know, face the music, pay the consequences, and learn their lesson, and then have a, a fresh slate when they begin. So, um, well, that's an experimental one-time only. I think we're the only school district that has something like that. So, I think that's pretty special. Yeah. <clears throat> Just on that one, why you mentioned, you know, uh, it says you have to be a senior, but if you're already applying, mm -hmm. you're already. That's only. I'll say any comment, but it seems yes. like it should be a junior because don't don't you? Does it matter? You don't really apply, apply until your senior year at all for acceptance. Yeah, you will do visits in your junior year and you'll take exams. But in terms of filling out the application, I mean, I, I see your point. I guess if there were a student who were trying to graduate early, but then they would be still considered a senior at that point. But it's meant to cover what exactly what you're saying. Right. Yes, I like the idea. I just, it, Senior years. It was it was a struggle to do that, and there was many variations. But the point you're making is what we were. But I think the policy committee did a good job at, at getting that, which is give somebody a chance, whether they're a junior or whether you know they they make their first mistake as a second semester senior. You know, if they deserve a break, they they get a break. It's hard to craft sometimes. Also, I would just like to add uh, and encourage it again for the community to to really dive deep into these policies and as you're reading them, ask yourself, you know, what, where do you stand philosophically in terms of handling um, uh, consequences? Are you, you know, more in the, the field of believing that the reason for consequences is to educate and, and help and move a student in the right direction or is it As a member of the policy committee and, the, and all the people who have um, added their hours and points, um, that as a as a committee we do believe in pushing the, um, the the goal of any consequence to be making the future of that student better and stronger and re rehabil rehabilitating uh, any major problems they might be having versus just punitive. Mm -hmm. so, I would encourage parents to have that in mind as they're reading this. And, and I just want to um, respond to one thing Michael said. Michael, I, I, the, the committee took, uh, went to great lengths to, to divide this policy. The, 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 the current existing policy, JICH, um, combines uh, student activity both, both on and off campus um, and consequences for for student behavior on campus for all students and consequences for off-campus behavior for certain students that are availing themselves of specific privileges like athletics and co-curricular activities. Um, the policy committee went to great lengths to, to separate those things, the, which is why I think you can consider this policy without the other policy. This policy is around um, prohibited substances at school on school and at school sponsored events. It's very specific. The consequences have to do with, um, uh, you know, for, for, for substances beyond tobacco and paraphernalia, the consequences have to do with suspensions. Um, and suspensions, um, the, the school, the, the suspensions have to do with removing the student from the, their, from a free and appropriate public education, which is their right. So the, the, um, that this policy has to do with the area where the school absolutely has jurisdiction, which is on school premises and at school events. Um, and it has specific academic consequences. And that's why I think it can be viewed separately from a policy which we might consider later, which has to do with um, students availing themselves of special privileges um, and whether those privileges are appropriate for students who are demonstrating you know, certain kinds of behavior we're trying to discourage. So that's a, that's a future conversation, but I think that's why um, that's why you can look at this policy without seeing the other one, and then we can talk about later about the whether there's other consequences. Uh, the other one deals m with more the scope. Does this, what behavior does this apply to? What activities? Well, that's, Where, it, that's, what it exactly. would, that's what that has to get to, okay. and that's not done, so I, I can't speak to that, but. No, I'm saying uh, that's the difference. And right. then the other thing I, I wanted to say that um, I wanted to just uh, uh, um, also speak to the, the referral to law enforcement. 
Um, the current policies, because we got a question from a, a citizen today about this today, and, and who, who seemed to think that our policy, our, our proposed policy, was too draconian on this issue. And the current policy says, for any offense on school grounds or at school-sponsored activity on or off school grounds, students shall be suspended from school and referred to the police. It's an automatic referral to police for any um, that's the old policy. Yeah. That's the, well, you say old, Still it's current. existing current. policy. Current. It's, current. Policy. it's old in my mind. All right. Um, that, well, that's not the, what we're proposing. That's not what we're proposing. Right. right, that's a good point. This is the, but it's the current policy. We're, so we are looking at a policy which does what, I think, David, what you articulated well, we're trying to do, which is to uh, address uh, substance issues among young people where they can be best and most constructively addressed, um, where they can be taught um, you know, other pathways, except in specific instances which, it, which allow for a, re a referral to police, which, ha which get to really dealing, right? It has to do with furnishing, selling, or manufacturing. So if we have students dealing prohibited substances on campus, uh, you know, that's an area where we, where, where we get law enforcement involved. Um, we view that differently. I think the policy views that differently at, um, from, um, from you know, a substance issue involving a student um, experimenting with a substance. So that I, wanted, I, I, I wanted to just make that point that I think we've made good progress in the direction that you've, you, you know, that you've um, lobbied for, and I think it is, um, it's appropriate, uh, and that's it. I don't mean to prolong this, but I'll just share with Michael that I was a really big proponent for separating the policies as far as what applies to all students all the time when they're at school or at school-sponsored activity. Separating that from students who are um, electing to avail themselves of privileges like uh, co-curricular and athletic because uh, not only just for the reasons that you know John enumerated, but when we were looking at survey results, it was it seemed very confusing. People people were having difficulty separating consequences and understanding. So it, it felt really important to separate those two policies because they are different policies and really shouldn't they, they don't go together. One may refer to the other, but mm -hmm. Um, what applies to everybody all the time when you're in school or at a school sponsored activity is absolutely not the same as you know the the standard that you may be held to because you chose to participate on a sport or a, you know a certain activity okay thank you thanks everyone for taking the time to I just say I think it would be the hope of the policy committee to bring these forward for adoption at the August meeting so yes. that they are in effect at the beginning of the upcoming academic year. Yes. So that would mean the policy committee would need feedback and to schedule a policy meeting at some time prior to that August board meeting. Right. And presumably that would include JJJ. would like to have JJJ in place as well. Well, I don't think that that would be possible without having a first read of JJJ at the next full business yeah. board meeting, um, True. unfortunately. Um, but soon thereafter. Okay. So should we put a deadline or a suggested date for... Do you have a policy committee back? meeting scheduled before August? Uh, it, by end of school year, I think, so our, our approach. June 20th. June 20th. While you're at it. <laughs> okay, so feedback from board members on, uh, on these policies by June 20th, which is a week from Friday. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item oh, six. And I'm sorry, I just want to point out that it's an LDAC, a licensed drug and alcohol counselor. I was um, channeling my inner ACDC <laughs> past life, and it's not that. I thought Thank ACDC you. was a rock band. I know. Yes. Oh. That's what I'm saying. Oh. <laughs> All right. Somehow I didn't buy her as ACDC. Um, item 6E, may I have a motion? I move we approve the adoption of Cape Elizabeth High School's mission statement. Is there a second? Second. Kate. 
Uh, any discussion? <laughs> I don't know if Jeff wants to. So, yeah, I mean, I could just say briefly, and, and Jeff can certainly add to this, um, as part of the New England Association of Schools and Colleges accreditation process, one of the things that needs to be in place for Cape Elizabeth High School is a mission statement. Um, the faculty work together this year, sort of looking at our existing mission, vision, and values. I didn't lump those words together this time. Um, and and examining its own culture and climate and its aspirations for students and developed this mission statement which was adopted at a faculty meeting in May, if I'm correct. So the hope would be that the board would adopt this mission statement either this evening or in August so that it can be in place um, as well for the upcoming year. Okay. And that, I would just have really briefly oh, for those of you who haven't had the pleasure of sort of watching a school go through the accreditation process, <laughs> Really, the entire accreditation process is a system that attempts to look at this question, whether the school's practices are reflecting these things on a day-to-day -day basis. They are reflecting these beliefs, uh, these values, and those sorts of things. Um, the particular categories of dividing it into core values, core beliefs about schools and learning, and then the learning expectations are very closely tied to the NIAS criteria. Um, that's why that's done, but all of the things are important and when we go through our own self-study and then eventually the team visit, which will be in 2016, um, the group that looks at us will be asking themselves, and we will be asking ourselves, how well do our practices match up to what we say we believe? And I will point out specifically that with respect to the things that are identified in learning expectations, and that's both with respect to the academic competencies and the civic and social competencies, there is an expectation <coughs> that those are things that the school actually measures and reports on down to the individual student level. So we have a lot of work to do to figure out exactly how we're going to do that. But um, we will get that work done. Awesome. Are there any questions for Jeff, Alisa? Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? This All is right. like a Joe motion. <laughs> yeah, I'm clearing my throat. Item F, may I have a motion, Joe? <laughs> I move that we approve the Cape Elizabeth School Department's request of the Maine Department of Education to grant an Option 5 extension through July 1st, 2020, for the requirement that students demonstrate proficiency in the standards of the eight content areas and the standards of the guiding principles in order to receive a diploma. Seconded. Uh, Meredith, do you want to um, <laughs> shed Try some to light? explain this? <laughs> I will do my best. Um, as, as the board is aware, we've had some discussion about proficiency-based diplomas over the course of this year. Um, Principal Shedd and Director of Instruction Ruth Ellen Vaughn presented to us on the state's expectation. Since that conversation, um, due to feedback from districts across the state, the state has provided this opportunity for districts to ask for extensions to that proficiency-based diploma process. Essentially, um, districts can ask for extensions through 2020, meaning that the um, proficiency-based requirement wouldn't go into effect until students graduating in 2021. So, our hope would be um, to request that extension. We've included for <laughs> you, somewhere in the back of the packet, our extension request, which is built upon much of the work already identified in the <coughs> plan. Um, again, this is, we believe in the idea of a proficiency-based diploma. Our frustration with the state's requirement was the timeline. So we believe this gives us the opportunity to do, to do this work the way we would have preferred to do, which is to begin that work at the middle level work with our students and our teachers at the middle school to begin identifying what proficiency-based standards look like while we're also building that work at the high school starting first with the guiding principles pieces those non-academic um, character core behavioral pieces that we think are so important for our students to develop mm -hmm. and then to gradually transition that into place as our students enter high school in 2018 so that then it be the academic pieces are in place for students starting ninth grade in the year 2018. So they would pilot, those students would pilot in 16, 17 at the middle level, 
and then do that work in 2018 at the high school level. That's great. Did we pass? Do you think the state's going to hold on to that? Do um, you think this is a done deal and this is the last timeline we've seen? Um, it, it, it's an interesting. Change. It's an interesting question. I mean, I think we never know exactly what may happen with the political winds shift um, at the state level. I will say that Maine is not the only state that has made movement towards proficiency-based graduation. That's a sort of growing movement, and Maine is not the only New England state to have made that transition. Whether or not that will sustain, I don't know. There are a number of state colleges and universities in yeah. the New England region who have signed on and said they support proficiency-based graduation. But that is, that is not yet um, universally true of, of colleges and universities. So I, I, I think the jury's still out a bit, but we believe that we can do this in a thoughtful way, in a meaningful way, and in a way that's going to help our students be informed about their own learning. That's great. I have a quick question, John. Have we already filed this mm -hmm. request? No, because it requires board approval. <clears throat> okay, right. Then I'm going to be really technical and give everybody a chance to give me a cheap shot. I think it should say consideration to authorize uh, the Keep Elizabeth School Department to request. Because otherwise we're, we're authorizing something you've already done, which you haven't. So I think it should be authorized the school department to request. And go ahead with your cheap shot if you want. What? You need to ask if that's a friendly amendment. Is that a friendly amendment, Joe? It's a grammatical friendly amendment. Are you, would you accept the amendment? Say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, with open mind and uh, uh, heart. Okay. <laughs> and an open door. <laughs> an open door. Uh, is there any further discussion? All those in favor? All right, seven zero. So, Elizabeth just um, pointed me to the Cape Elizabeth uh, website which says that uh, Cape voters passed the school budget uh, with 72 percent of the voters supporting the budget. Great. 72 percent support. Okay. That's something. That's great news. In, in preschool we say give yourself a big hug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so thank you to everyone who came out today and voted um, uh, on the school budget, and, and uh, we're very glad to have the support of the community um, once again, and, and uh, that's just fantastic news. Um, so that said, on to item G. Uh, may I have a motion? I move we oh. authorize a $20,000 budget transfer between the funding categories regular instruction, contingency, and system administration. Is there a second? Okay. Uh, Meredith, do you want to explain? I'd be happy to. Okay. So this, under state law, we are required to transfer funds between our categories. Remember, we, port, we report budget in categories to the state. So there are a number of categories, one of which is regular instruction, another of which is uh, system administration. There's building administration. Um, special education is another category. So of those 10 categories, if any is, if, if any is five, more than 5% above or below what we had budgeted, we need to make adjustments. And the board has to approve those adjustments. Do, the system administration category is a relatively small category. And um, due to the retirement of our business administrator, Paulina Portria, who due to her number of years of work in the district, um, had a retirement benefit that was due to her, as well as the fact that we couldn't go the remainder of the year without some replacement um, for her, we have exceeded that system administration category by le less than $20,000, but to be on the safe side, we're requesting a transfer of $20,000 because the school year is not yet over, or the fiscal year is not yet over. So, so I, just to make two points of clarification. Yes. This is not in addition to our budget. This, these you. funds are already in the budget. These aren't, this is not a new expenditure. It's just a, a, re, a transfer of categories. And secondly, that um, it's not entirely due to the, although it says due to the retirement of the business manager, Correct. it's due to the fact also that we hired a, a, a replacement business manager part-time to help Correct. us get through the year and the budget season and so forth. So um, just didn't want to no, thank you for that clarification. And the reason that we've identified contingency is the, the intent of contingency is for unanticipated expenses. And so to reflect the fact that 
those things do happen um, in the course of a year, we're, we're recommending that that funding be drawn from the contingency line in, within regular instruction. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Okay, seven. Uh, are there committee chairs who have reports to <coughs> briefly say at the past uh, monthly meeting, um, I, you know, I, I, every time I go, I get very excited about <clears throat> what they offer students, but in particular, um, how the, the potential for harnessing um, what they offer for, for our students here as an adjunct. Um, for example, one discussion um, was as we were leaving, um, the horticulture, horticulture program and, and what you know possibilities some, one might imagine <coughs> tying into our uh, mission statement um, for just supplementing and adding or, or wholly um, um, uh, you know, someone who's, who would, I'm mean, losing my train of thought now, <laughs> so tired. But uh, yeah, so um, that's the, the main thing I want to say and they're all, and they're, um, you know, constantly trying to gain attention and new students increase their roster um, and perhaps in the fall um, we could arrange a, a meeting for them to come and um, meet with the middle school eighth graders in particular um, so that so that parents and students are aware of what um, is out there and what is available to everyone um, and then Meredith, they have a waiver to for their school year calendar so, under, under state law, um, the current law reads that sending districts to our regional vocational technical centers can have no fewer than five uncommon calendar days. So you can imagine that as you look at the nine sending districts and 16 sending schools who attend um, Portland Area Technical High School, that that might be a challenge. Um, you just think about early release days or conference days or when teacher workshop days are scheduled, that that becomes very challenging. All of the districts who send students to paths have agreed and, and attested in writing um, to the Commissioner of Education that we will provide transportation to our students on days that paths is not in session so that they have the opportunity to be there. Um, but in addition, we all also, all of those districts and the attendance of our students and our uncommon calendars, the, we all exceed the number of minimum hours required for attendance at paths under state law. So, so we believe for those reasons that the commissioner will support this waiver request and that we do not have to match our calendar to all of the surrounding districts who um, send their students to paths. Thank you, Susanna. Are there any other committee chairs who wish to report? I think we've covered policy. <laughs> Do we need to go over teacher evaluation or should we wait until next time? Because Yeah, I mean, I think we can certainly say um, teacher evaluation committee has been meeting. Um, we are currently, because of the change in the law that we reported on, I believe at our last meeting, um, waiting a vote of the faculty on whether or not the current committee um, will be authorized to continue. And so that will require a majority vote of the faculty and we expect that vote to be completed um, by the end of the school year. And um, depending on the results of that vote, one committee or another will begin the work um, again in the fall and continue, continue the process of developing an evaluation system to meet our needs. Okay. Thank you. Any other committee reports? <coughs> Item eight, um, so are there a request for future agenda items? Not a request for a future agenda item, but because the board requested some future agenda items at its retreat, I just want to point out that a, workshop a draft workshop calendar for next year was included at the very back of your packet. So if there are topics missing from there, it would be helpful if you can let John or I know if there are things that you don't see captured that you believe we identified in that retreat. Thank you for putting that together. Mm. Very well. Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Um, we, we will likely need a, a board meeting. Um, uh, if we hire an assistant, high school assistant principal, we'll need a board uh, when? meeting. When? When we hire a high school assistant principal, we will need a board meeting um, to approve that hire. And um, we probably, we will also need a board meeting when we um, complete 
uh, negotiations with the association. Um, so I don't know when that will be, um, but you'll be the first to know <laughs> when we're able to schedule it. All right, are there other meeting and upcoming meeting announcements? Yes. So I actually did my homework, and there is a community services advisory committee meeting tomorrow night at 6.30 at the community services in their conference room. They will be discussing long-range needs assessment um, on access to their facilities, um, the facilities themselves, the kind of programs they're offering, and the types of services they offer in order to have a better um, grasp of what our community needs um, and to serve them better. Um, and then also upcoming policy committee meeting, although we are wrapped up right now for the summer, um, stay tuned. You all will also be the first to know when there is the next policy committee meeting. Um, just a reminder, if you didn't, if you're still with us and um, <laughs> need to be reminded, we're looking for feedback on the first reads that went out tonight, ADC, JIC, JICH, JICHR, and JKD by June 20th, and we will be posting a, um, a policy committee sometime in early August at which we will review those suggested um, comments on those as well as look at JJJ and other policies. Thank you, Joe. Item 10, may I have a motion? Don't hold up. Oh no. my God, I move that we adjourn. Second. Yes. Second, all those in favor. Seven. Okay. So tired. <laughs>